Hey everyone, welcome to That Pedal Show. Dan here. Mick here. Tim here. Hello. Amazing. Uh, joined by the wonderful Mr. Tim Lurch today, who is over here with uh, doing a guitar breaks. So um, lucky, lucky people get to hang out with Tim for a whole weekend and pick his brains on mm. all of this amazing stuff. Mate, thank you so much for coming oh, in. This is awesome. It's my pleasure. I just can't believe how fun it's going to be. <laughs> awesome. It's great. For those of you who don't know, we do a live uh, Q&A every Monday, or most Mondays, in fact, and Tim's quite often in the comments and always offers a little bit of wisdom uh, in those comments, so we will mine that a little further Indeed. today. And Indeed. Dan, I believe you've also had a lesson with Tim I've, in the past. Yeah, I have. I, I, so I saw Tim on the, this YouTube clip came up, and I'm like, it was just beautiful and uh and i reached out and he said yeah yeah i can you know i'll do lessons and i'm like oh awesome and it was amazing i'm still i'm still going through it because oh. you know tim was uh, kind enough to um if you get a lesson with tim tim actually records it his end and sends it through and stuff which is really great oh nice um we will put links in the description below to all of tim's stuff so um if you're wanting to get to that stuff the links will be below yeah but yeah i saw yeah, first saw you on the tube. Well, first you said something about me, and someone said a bunch of people said, "Hey, they're talking about you on that show." <laughs> that's what. That's that, okay. Where started. Well, that would have been on because I. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> I would have been. I saw that. I saw the clip and just gone, man. This guy's just blown my mind. <laughs> the telly show. Um, yeah. We'll cover a bunch of stuff today. Um, I think definitely we'll do some playing stuff. We want to talk about tone. Tim as well and that kind of thing you're into but let's start with a bit of biography a bit of biographical stuff okay. <laughs> um we know as you uh, as an educator um fill us in fill us in quick briefly on how we get here oh okay um i heard country music on the radio when i was a little boy right one of my earliest memories is um on the 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 bunk beds with a transistor radio listening to something uh, on the AM radio. It's probably the Rolling Stones or something like that, but maybe a little early for Rolling Stones. It's probably about 62 or 3 because I was born in 59. So music has always been uh, really important. Uh, I, basically, I've been cooked since day one. <laughs> wow. And Were your um, parents like heavily into music? Uh, no. Um, Interesting. My mom played sort of gospel or churchy piano in the key of F after dinner. <laughs> it's very specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the key of F was the only key that all the notes worked in. Oh, in about okay. An and a half. Right. Um, and half the keys didn't have the ivory on them. They were just wood. Right. Uh, but my father uh, was completely unmusical. I don't think he ever really listened to music. He didn't listen to music in the car or or anything and sang badly in church. You know? okay. so, um, but he gave me the best bit of musical advice that I've ever gotten from anybody, which I'll get to in a moment. Sure. Uh, so growing up like that and wanting to play music, I swear to you guys, I don't know if you're into sort of any of this kind of idea about uh, previous lives or anything like that. Sometimes there's a fair amount of poo-pooing about that. But I swear to you, when I was three years old, I wanted to do this. When I first got my hands on a guitar, it was a nylon string guitar, and I was in about third grade, and it wasn't my guitar. I didn't get my own for a little while, but I got that guitar, put it in my lap, and I went. Wow. <laughs> At three years old. Well, no, by the time I got it, I wanted to do that. I heard yeah, yeah. that sound. You know, and my mom was listening to um, California country radio, mm -hmm. and so that had, you know, the twangier side of sure. country music, perhaps. Uh, the Bakersfield, Bakersfield stuff and yeah, all that yeah, stuff. Sure. And Pencils, well, some of that. Up yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but I knew I wanted to do something like that. And I, and I, first time I picked up a guitar, I did that. Mm. Don't know. And my mom says, I'm in the back seat of the car in the station wagon. I do that. And she goes, Timmy, that sounds like something. <laughs> and then I didn't know what to do after that. So it took me quite a few years to get to the rest of it, you know, like the turnaround or whatever. But anyway, that's, so that's kind of a, my karmic sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, duty or something. Right. Is that music has is, is always been there. But you uh, felt like as soon as you picked up a guitar, you felt connected. Oh, man. As soon as I picked up a guitar, I was a professional musician. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> which which plays into something I talked uh, with uh Keith Williams about just the other day on on his show uh, uh, Five Watt World. Five Watt World. If yeah. you're not familiar with Keith's show, please check him out. Five um, Watt World on YouTube. We're talking about this balance between learning as a student and 
enjoying it mm-hmm. and finding joy in it. And I talked about how we always have to remind ourselves, no matter how deep we are into learning, that we're a musician. And I said something like, on day two, you're a musician. You have a lot of work to do, but you're still a musician. Right. And I think that's easy to forget that. Like, I suck. I can't do the thing I'm working on, so I'm no good. But what about all the things you can do? Right. Right. And so we just that that's just sort of a thing that maybe it comes from that when I was just a little kid. And I, 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 I just pretended until I got better at it. You know? I'm still pretending. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm convinced. Good, the pretending is a good strategy. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. works in rock and roll, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. Have you, did you ever have a proper job or have you, uh, did you go straight into being a pro player? Um, yeah, I had a proper job. Let's see. I washed cars for two days. <laughs> um, that's enough to know. Wow. I mean, I did what stuff in the... Three, I four. hurt my back really bad climbing in and out. Um, I had, you know, neighborhood jobs. Mm. I did. I learned, you know, how to pour concrete for a neighbor and take care of the lady's dog down the street when they went on vacation and mowed some lawns and stuff. Uh, then I got a job at the hospital, and I was in the kitchen at the hospital. This was by the time I was 16 and could legally work. Uh, and um, I have the evidence of it right there. You might even see, still see that. Oh, my goodness. I bought a copy Les Paul with my hospital money. Right. Put it, payments on it and paid it off. It was, a, I believe it must have been an Ibanez or a, or a Fujigen. Right. Yeah, yeah. There was no name up here, though. And it was not a bolt on wow. neck. Huh. It was a very good Les Paul. Wow. And I paid off, paid off, paid off. On a, picked it up one night, got home, played it all night, went to school, went to my job. Cut the almost the entire tip of my first finger off on a tomato, and, and I and so I had to play for about three months with just these three fingers, or maybe 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 not maybe a month and, a, and change. So I got good with that with the tail end. <laughs> then finally this one came back, and I have a pretty decent scar there. And it, to this day, I have nerve damage in this finger. No way. So when you see me playing. I'd say, right, I played with, the, with, that, with, that, with that part that of my wow. finger because it's more economical and the tip of my finger hurts. <laughs> so I don't go, to me, it's a bigger tone. Is that too loud? No. no. Oh. no. Um, Dude. <laughs> no, he means for talking over. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So, so I have, now I have arthritis in this finger, which is another old man problem. Talk about that sometimes. But yeah, so I carved this one up pretty good. Um, That's fascinating because I think there's a lot of people, uh, myself included, who will come up with every excuse under the sun why we're not a better guitar player. My hands are too small. My finger hurts. Whatever it might be. You've gone, actually, no, I've nearly cut my finger off and it hurts, so I'll find another way to do it. Mm -hmm. And presumably that then leads into how you sound that becomes part of your sound and your intonation and everything else yeah thank you for noticing <laughs> uh, yeah i don't i never had any trouble with like something like that where you you know or these big whoops missed it by one but but this hurts wow Especially on a guitar with a high nut, with a two high nut. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so then, but well, it hurts because it's, I don't know if anybody has neuropathy, but it kind of just hurts in a very special way. Because <laughs> uh, it's not, ah, it's not, it's, but it's just the weirdest hurt, you know, yeah, nerve yeah. pain that, you know, anyway. So was that the moment you thought, right, working is for losers? Well, yeah, I did that job guitar. for a while and, and I actually, um, uh, but then I didn't do it. And then, then I work in record stores and music stores. That mm. was the way I kind of got through my learning days mm. when I was not good enough to really make a living at playing. But so it, I was in the musical environment and I would get it, go in and out. I was kind of itinerant. I had some, you know, friends in the music store and music uh, record business, you know, who were there and they liked me so I could go wandering <laughs> and then come back and, you know, all that kind of thing. So what are we, we're mid-70s now, are we? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and in terms of what were you listening to then? What what music was, oh, was... Okay, I loved radio. I listened and memorized and could recognize pop songs on the radio. 
me and you and a dog named Boo and all this sort of like 70s mm -hmm. pop music, you know, good, bad and indifferent. Some mm -hmm. of it was very good. Some of it was very bad. Um, when you say you listen to it and can recognize it, are you saying you could listen to it, analyze it, know what the chords were? Well, no, not not maybe at first, uh, just the sound. So we, they had a contest on the on the radio when I was, you know, 11 or 12. Uh, they'd play a song and who, if you could guess it in the first three seconds or something like that, you won a prize or something like that. So I could always hear the first few notes of a song and know what song it was. <laughs> so that's that first kind of recognition, mm -hmm. right? So you recognize rhythm and tone and beats, not necessarily chords and stuff. Sure. Um, uh, but yeah, it, melody re really came easy for me. And so I would do this thing where I still kind of do it, sort of the, my first improvising, I think, um, where I'd sing a song that I heard on the radio or I'd be listening to it on the radio and then I would play a little lick in between the phrases. I would sing a little, a little lick in between the phrases um, just to fill in the space. Mm. And just, sorry, to confirm that, you would sing it rather than play it on the guitar. I couldn't play it on the guitar yet. So you weren't so, guitar, Yeah, before you... I was really, I, I didn't start playing guitar till I was around 13 or 12. Oh, no but even before that, like there'd be a song, um, I'm trying to think of a good one here. Uh, okay, a bad one. <laughs> okay. Ba ba da 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 I was doing that shit. And you were just filling in. Yeah, I was just filling in. And, you know, because it always drove me crazy when people would sing a song and just leave out the empty parts. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we've accompanied this person. Right. Right? <laughs> I did it my way. Da, da, da. You know what I mean? To just leave out the empty parts. Right. And those empty parts are very important, so I would fill them in with little ditties. <laughs> still do. <laughs> That's still what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, I believe I'm playing Taya Yellow Bear Ribbon. Cut that part out. <laughs> so let's get into when you knew that this was it. Yep. And you started taking it seriously. Yep. Because it seems to me that uh, you've been an educator of, like, you know, the conversation we had before for over 50 years now, or close to, close, close yeah. to 50 years. Yeah. What was those early things like with you know guitar teaching th and things yeah. and, and what did you find was effective and worked yeah. i say that if i won the lottery mm -hmm. i would find all of my first say 100 students and give them all their money back mm -hmm. okay um because i didn't know what to do right i learned you know i learned by doing i would oftentimes be one page ahead uh you know in the oh, mel okay. bay book you know yeah right and um but I got this, I was in a situation, this was later, a little later. Um, I think I am personality wise, I love sharing and I love, and that means teaching is something I really love. Oh, that's awesome. I, I had this thing, hey, let me show you this cool thing. Yeah. You know? I mean, we just, so we we're just doing it before while well, we we're having a chat. And. Um, you remember? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Good. Um, but it was mind blowing. And Tim was like, is that thing? I was like, have you have you tried this? And I'm like, no, show me. And I got so excited, then Mick comes over and I'm like, just give me a minute. I'm so, you know. But Dan, you see this scrunched up piece of paper here? Yeah, yes. It's amazing. It's, isn't a, it? it's amazing. But but I but there's there is that thing, because you are so passionate about it, there is that thing that I I want what you've got. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I and, and it because you know, I'm really serious about trying to learn this stuff. And, and there's a very different way of communicating when you are genuinely passionate and, be, and you genuinely, you genuinely want to help mm. people learn this stuff. Cause I've had some awful teachers, you know, who just really couldn't, it's like, well, this is what I have to teach you to get this great. And 
if you can't do it, it's not it's it's on it's not on you. It's uh, not on me. It's on you. I, I'm I'm going to quote some philosophy here to you here, Dan, which I think might have come from Tim on one of our VCQs, <laughs> and I think tell me if I'm wrong here. T the student and the teacher together create the learning. Okay, that's very good. All right. You well, can, I was a terrible I student. I don't think then. you can always blame the teacher. No, 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 no. I'm just saying. My, my heart goes out to guitar teachers because. <laughs> but it's a very different experience learning from a teacher who genuinely wants you to learn. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Rather than, God, can you teach my kid how to play a rock and roll song, please? Because yeah, yeah. I need to go to the bar for an hour. It's a different thing, isn't it? Well, you know, most of us from our generation, I can include us in Indeed. the same Indeed. generation, although I may be making a big mistake. Um, is is the the guy down the street knows one thing, mm -hmm. and you you know one thing, and you get together, and now you both know two things. Right, right. That's great. So that's really great. That's, right. that's mm -hmm. like the they say. There's you know, uh, there's a spiritual illusion as well. If you have a candle and you light another candle with it, your candle doesn't go away. Your flame doesn't go away, but the new one there goes. Up, yeah, right. right. It doesn't take anything away from this candle to light that candle, if only perhaps momentarily, but then it recovers. Um, I try in all of my teaching, and I do a lot of it in different fashions, like I'm going to be doing this coming weekend with a group of people. So mm -hmm. somehow you got to make a connection with the individuals, you know, and find out where they're at and what, how they learn and what they want to learn and all those kinds of things. But I try and keep it a little bit like that, mm -hmm. right? I got this cool thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to give it to you and you can do it with <laughs> right. it what you want. Uh, I think that's a, a, an organic and wonderful way to keep it alive sure keep it joyful learning can turn into drudgery and i it makes me sad when that happens right. when we're on a schedule when we're on a timeline when we're on a you know a curriculum that's been developed so that you can get a passing grade and fulfill whatever whatever mm. i just i just don't think people learn that way very well right. mm -hmm. and they learn or they learn in a certain way yeah. which doesn't stay with them um and so I try and honor that. In my, so I'm not in a hurry. I try not to put my own agenda on anybody. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes my excitement, in my excitement, I might. Um, but uh, sometimes I just feel like they want a guitar friend, a musical friend that yeah. they can relate to mm -hmm. for an hour. And that's especially with adult, adult learners. We don't necessarily want to march in and get an hour's worth of information yeah. However, often, once a week or twice To a be month. fair, we find that on our experience days as well. It's Dan's quote is, it's a lot to have in common with somebody. And it's a very, mm. you know, to use a modern term, it's a safe space. And mm -hmm. it's a great deal to have in common with someone to, to share that, to share it, isn't it? Absolutely. Because yeah. I think when you're passionate about music and you play, if you experience being connected to an instrument and and you experience that connection in a group with you know when you're playing music together there is nothing in the world like it like my my some of my closest friends are still the guys i was in my first band with right and you can't explain that to people mm -hmm. no. you can't explain what it's like to pick up a guitar and go and the feeling of that chord yeah the only people you can talk to about it is guitar players. Oh, the people yeah, that yeah. play guitar. <laughs> Everyone you know? else goes, I don't get it, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Speaking I, of bands, Tim, how over the years, how has the proportion of kind of pro professional playing and educating worked out for you? Depend. I think generally speaking, um, it was an even mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Different. There were ups and downs. More of this or more or less of that. If I'm on the road, of course, I'm not doing teaching. Um, in the in the old days, you know, you had to do one or the other. You couldn't. Sure. There weren't any online venues. But um, I like a blend of it. I mm -hmm. find if I do too much of too much teaching, I get a little dry. I need it to be fresh. And if I do too much playing, I get a little grumpy too. Right. Like too much hassling. I love to play. I play ten hours a day. But but um, you play ten hours a day. No no no. But I will. Uh, oh, I see. I'm happy to. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. And if you know, uh, not too long ago, I was teaching. I was kind of getting my feet back on the ground in terms of my finances and stuff because I had taken a, a lengthy break and I didn't have any income at all during that lengthy break. So when I came back to this land, um, the land of people, I was teaching, you know, sometimes eight hours a day. So I'd have a guitar in my hand. Then I'd go home and I'd, before I left, I'd write curriculum and I'd come home and I'd, you know, play for my own enjoyment or whatever. So it was a lot. Mm. And, um, these days I have to moderate that because the the machine is falling apart a little bit. 
Um, but I was, I was talking to my wife this morning about something. I can't remember how we started, but uh, just this idea of practicing and, and it, having it be fulfilling because I said, you know, it can take two hours of practicing to get one good 10 minutes of beautiful music. Wow. Okay. You know, and, and she said, oh, that's a good one. I got to remember that one. And and so it's a, you have to love the practicing because it it facilitates the, the what the eventual joy of playing something beautiful right you know that's very good uh, and and i think if we have it if we have it in that perspective um, we can learn happily we can do the repetitions that are necessary to take the thing you've learned and make it into something you can use mm -hmm. and then we can play and be confident in it and be adventurous with it right yeah. yeah we've talked about that a lot on the show actually that that idea of to simplify, you know, removing the middleman. So all that work you do is mm -hmm. building the foundation, exactly what you were just saying, the hours and the hours of work. But then when it comes time to play, that thought process is different and mm -hmm. it flows. Mm -hmm. Are you, uh, yeah, I, I feel like the, there's three things, briefly, three kind of kind of things we can call practicing. And we don't always make a distinction. And it's, I think it's helpful to make a distinction. One is the learning part. And I, my opinion is you learn a small thing, you learn it well, and you don't learn too much of it. Right. Right. Little bite-sized chunks. Bite-sized chunks. So I say, and maybe I make a little joke about it, I say, take small bites, chew them well, and then you can digest. Then you'll be able to digest. <laughs> very good. That's very good. So, so then the next thing, probably the most important thing, is the repetitions that I call the practicing. So you learn and then you practice. You have to practice the thing you learned efficiently um, and enough so that you can actually use that thing, particularly mm -hmm. in an improvisational capacity, but mm -hmm. even in a playing a fixed piece. Um, so you learn something, small bit, practice it. Maybe you learned three things, practice them. Maybe you learned three things the other day or the week before. You have to keep practicing them. So the middle of the three is the really where you live much. Uh, I think sometimes we get a little greedy and we look around and we see this that human beings have a, a, an essentially acquisitive uh, kind of mind. We want to get, get. So we don't know we, what you're talking about. We, we like the getting. Yeah, we yeah. just, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah. And we get, sometimes we get too much too soon, especially these days. Mm. Yeah. You know? And so, um, and we forget about the part where the payoff comes, where we can actually yeah, use okay. the tool that we. Yeah. You know, so the tools aren't out in the shed getting rusty. Mm. With you can't get to them. You need them like in your breast pocket or in your nose or you know behind your ear and really close to the deal. Yeah, that's yeah. where the tools have to live. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then the third thing, which I think is also very important, is what I call the performance, which is when you actually play music, and that's when you turn into turn back into a musician. You're not a student anymore. You're playing. Right. You're, you're, and all three of those things have to be in a balance. And it's very valuable when they are. They might sometimes be out of balance. Like if you're shedding for a gig or something, you might have to learn a whole bunch of things really quick. And you can't honor that. Say, I'm sorry, Bob, I can't make the gig tonight because I, I followed Tim's advice and I just haven't learned all the songs. <laughs> you know, so you, you might have to make some shortcuts and you might have to trust your instincts and Perhaps by the time you get a level of skill that you can learn more quickly, learn more efficiently, your musical memory might be stronger and the practicing part can be a little less. Um, and the final thing is there's a, there are three different kinds of mindsets for those three things and all the gray that flows in between. Mm. The first, the learning part, the mind is very active, very judgmental, very articulate, and, and we want to make it right. We yeah. want to learn without mistakes slowly. Mm. We want to control environment. Right, and that might only last ten minutes or fifteen minutes, but it's very much the mind is r running, the, ruling the roost. Right, the repetition part. I mean, you know, like I say, you can watch golf and do that. Mm. You know, and it's a relaxed mind that still has some attention on the details, but it's relaxed. Right, it's not a, it's not a, um, a sweatshop. Okay, okay, and then the third mind is almost nothing. I love that. That is, is the most eloquent way I've ever put it. I think of all the fabulous people we've had in here, they've said a version of the same thing. I've never heard it broken down like that. And yeah. I may have broken it down in too large of chunks that yeah, so yeah. that it might not be as relatable. But look at if you look at your daily practicing, I think all three of those things, those things need to happen. If sure, you're going to yeah, give yeah, up yeah. one, give up the learning a new thing. 
and just do the repetition, but always do the playing. Every single day of your life, when you have this thing in your lap, you have to be, remember and remind yourself, I am a musician. Right. You know, like I say, on day two, you have to remind yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and without getting too caught up in it, if you find that your your progress is impeded or you're unhappy with what you're doing, chances are you're either at the wrong stage or in the wrong mindset for the situation that exactly. you're currently yeah. in. That's yeah, really right. great. Yeah, if you, really the, great. the biggest killer to the, the second, well, I'll just go through them. The biggest killer to the first one is wanting too much. Mm -hmm. The biggest killer for the second one is wanting too soon. And the biggest killer for the third one is wanting anything. Excuse my ignorance, you must have written this in a book. No, I, I, I decided that my contribution to Zen literature is to be abs to abstain from writing a book. <laughs> Although I'm breaking that rule, sorry. Well, I've got, I've Just, got your latest book, uh -huh. your, yes. um, the chord harmony. <laughs> what's, it, what's it called, Luke? Melodic Jazz Guitar Chord Dictionary. There you go. There you go. Melodic false, Jazz Guitar Chord right Dictionary. Right off the tongue. Right? Luke and Ian are with us today, who are uh, both involved in Tim's uh, course this weekend. So, On Guitar Vivo, a book that I made exactly, almost exactly a year ago that Luke and, I and I made. Links below. Um, is, is called the Melodic, Melodic Jazz Guitar Chord Melodic. Dictionary, a book I was reluctant to write until Luke um, asked a really wonderful question. He said because I turned him down uh, politely, I hope. And he said, well, if you were to write a chord dictionary, what kind would you write? What would it have to be for you to be on board with it? And I said, well, I think that if there was a chord dictionary that was organized by the melody note of the chord rather than the name of the chord. So if you're looking for an A major chord with a third on top, you could find it like that. Just boom, beep. Can you uh, example, show us some of that, okay. please? Okay. So let's say I'm trying, I, I'm going to use the, something from my world. I don't want to limit it to, to anybody else's world. But let's say I'm trying to play a song, The Days of Wine and Roses. Mm -hmm. The Days of Wine and Roses starts with um, a fifth on top of a major chord. Once I lived a life of wine and roses. Yes, and it's the saddest song ever. My dad is a massive country fan. Dad, if you're watching this, thank you for the education. <laughs> so the song goes. Okay, so here, I have an F chord. That's mm -hmm. what the sheet music tells me, the fake book or whatever. C, A. Well, if I, if I don't, I could say, well, that's okay. That's okay. That's kind of it, right? So I decided to fill in the blanks a little bit. You need an F with a C on top, or maybe you don't need an F with a C on top. You certainly need an F with an A on top if you want to go. Because it could be argued that this C is from a C seventh chord. Okay. So how do I make an A, sorry, an F with an A on top? And there's so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know which one to pick, right? Well, the book has got them all next to each other. And you can look them up in the index. You can even search wow. on the PDF. F with the third, you know, the, the third in the melody, right? And um, so then it gives, it gives all the F chords that have that attribute are together. That's really good. But then how on earth do you organize that? Because then there are all the other notes. Yes. <laughs> well, what happens is it's a phenomenal thing. <laughs> it's a really phenomenal thing because the stuff is always in the same place every time. <laughs> so once you learn that this one's here, well, then you can go on to that one, yeah. and then this one, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. Um, I do a thing. It's it's a fun little. Can I? Can please, I, okay. please, please, please. Okay. Let's say you've got. What we want to do is we want to develop um, uh, the ability to create fluid harmony rather than a bunch of fixed. I call them fixed grips. 
we want to take the concrete and we want to make it fluid. Mm. So a fixed grip being, I know this, my... This, this picture, yeah. 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 Boop, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, not so much scale, although scale could... Sorry, I meant... Because the scale yeah, yeah. is fluid by its nature. Chords mm. tend to be concrete by their nature. Yeah. Right. And the way we learn songs is we learn, you know, it ain't no use to sit and wonder why. You know, we learn a, a fixed way, like yeah. Bob Dylan yeah. played it or whatever. Sorry, that was horrible. Um, actually, actually really good. It was a good impression of Bob, to be fair. Yeah, I'll play it. Yeah. Are sufficiently out of tune now. So let's say I, I want to make an exercise that that um, facilitates and encourages um, breaking down the edges of these fixed chords that we're so proud of learning. Because we learn, let's say you learned how to play a Bad Company song in 1976. Yep. Mm -hmm. Played it in the band. And in order to play that song and sound correct, you played it the same way as you perceived it to be on the record with the same grips and the same rhythm. The Well, then we come to wanting to learn how to play jazz. Yes. And we kind of have the same mindset. Yeah. Right. right. Yep. So then we have this complaint like, well, I'm playing, I'm playing rhythm changes, one, six, two, five at, you know, like 180 beats per minute. But I only know one way to get through that. And it goes by in about 30 seconds. And then the song is five minutes long. I'm just going to supposed to go around and around. It gets boring. And also, if I'm accompanying somebody, it's not accompanying, by the way, it's more improvisational than improvising yeah. solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. In jazz, yep. in, in, in in that kind of music, I, I have to be able to re react and relate and encourage and support and back off and push and pull. All of that stuff is spontaneous. So we we got to work on something that allows for that. So if I just have a two five one six. In the key of G, so A minor, D seven. G major, E7, sharp nine, or something. Mm -hmm. What if I had a different note on top of every chord, but in a systematic way? So I'm going to take the scale of G major, and I'm going to go to a new note on top of every chord going up. So the rule is of this game is I'm going to ascend the melody one chord, uh, one note per chord. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start on this one just because it makes for a fun situation. <laughs> play that note which isn't in the key yeah. it's kind of because it's, it's helping you get it becomes the leading tone for the yeah, yeah. Note, right? yeah okay. and that then I'd, I'd learn because I went like this I'd have a C, a C note on top of my G chord and it starts to sound proper so so we put in a cap the occasional chromatic note so you do that enough and pretty soon this the visualizing of the basic grips is strong enough so that you can play this instead of this and then put that melody note on and then there are variations on the mm -hmm. theme. Two notes per chord. Right? And I'm just going up the key. Just once again, I want to say that I've heard people explain this stuff to me many times. Dan gets it. I don't. I have never, ever, ever heard it broken down like that to the point where I go, I get I it. I can do that. Yeah. Oh, like you obviously sure can. I can't. I'm going to need to learn the, the chords and the and to to get some right, but muscle memory. Yeah. But I understand what you're doing Good. for the first time. Oh, nice. <laughs> and the trick is not thinking that this is somehow a new one thing to memorize. Yeah. yeah. This is just part of that. Uh, yeah. 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 A little yeah, yeah, bit yeah. of a thingy on top. Okay. So now the third thing, after you've done a uh, diatonic movement of one to one or two to one or whatever you like. What does diatonic mean? Diatonic means using only notes that are in a particular key. The seven notes in a major key would be um, that we would use that word diatonic to describe um, a song or a, or a passage that didn't leave the key. Uh, Non-diatonic is something... Groovy. That that leaves the key or introduces a non-diatonic note. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take the same thing, A minor to D to G to E7 of some kind, mm -hmm. 
and we're going to do a chromatic upper passage. So that means that the notes are going up, but they're going up stepwise unless it's going to be a train wreck, and then I'll maybe do Adjust. a whole step or something. Mm -hmm. So a, a minor 11, A minor 7 flat 5, D9, D7 sharp 9, G major 7 with this, okay, then leads very nicely to this. And then I'm going to make A minor into A7 flat 9 because the melody note is B flat, and it would be a little clunky on top of A minor. Yeah, but... Now, let's check this out. That is a chord that, if you go to music school, they'll say, don't do that, young man. So it's a D7 with a C sharp in the melody. Right. But in this context... It's beautiful. It's perfectly fine. Now, there are all kinds of other things you can do to that. You can add... I'm sorry, I'm making squeaking sounds again. You can say... What I just did there is I went up with the melody and I went sort of down with the bass. And that's just a little trick. That so the game. The reason I call it a game is it want, you know we want a game to be fun, and we want learning to be fun. We mm. want to enjoy ourselves. And I can do this for two or three hours and never really feel like I've had a long session or wow. you know what i mean just yeah. it's because it's just musing about it mm. the rules are simple things go up things go down you know just briefly i can take the same idea and say <laughs> this is gonna be funny because it's a flat third on top of a major chord so i'm going to make it dominant and then i'm going to change key Right, so you can play the game any way you like. Yeah, yeah. You can do it with blues. You can do it with any chord progression. Uh, learning a song, like I played that song, Don't Think Twice It's All Right, a minute ago. Right? So I can do it with that. I can say... <laughs> and that becomes my temp, my sort of my my palette, or the you know. So I have to, I have to ask, just backing up a little bit. I'm going to say most of us, which is a ridiculous phrase. It's, it's it's too reductive, but certainly a lot of guitar players I know anyway. You hear ACDC on the radio, or you hear whatever it is. In my case, it was it was blues playing, but straight ahead one four five type blues. You get your head around a few chords. And that's what you do for the next 45 years. Mm -hmm. And there's no shame in that, by the way. That's why it's I do. awesome. Um, at what point did you say, actually, I can hear something different here. There's something more harmonically interesting. Again, it's, I don't want to use, I don't want to suggest that simplistic guitar playing is somehow worse or because by saying more interesting, it implies the other thing is less interesting, but more complex, more harmonically involved. What made you go, that's more interesting to me? I think what might have happened, Mick, is that I had a pretty good knack for melody. Melody didn't slow me down at all. Mm. And what I didn't feel like I could really hear was the inner voices, huh? uh, my own and <laughs> Nelson Riddle's. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but, you know, if I hear a piano player, I'd hear the low note and the high note, but I, that that... Beautiful stuff in the middle I couldn't always hear. So I started listening to orchestras, and I started finding that I could pick it out better. Or if I listened to a a well-arranged a well ensemble of any kind, uh, brass ensembles are really fun for that because there's each voice is unique, and they blend to make a beautiful thing, but you can follow any of them, mm. right? So the notion that harmony is nothing but melody swimming together and to control the voices really captured me as an intellectual game, as, an, as a thing that melted my ears and my heart. Mm. All of those things combined for me in harmony. Um, and then I also uh, love music. I love ballads. I love lush music. I'm not really big on like super fast or super aggressive or super loud or super, uh, you know, angry or anything like that. Um, and so there's a kind of... I feel like the world we live in is 
perhaps lacking beauty, or or probably wouldn't wouldn't be worse if there were more of it. <laughs> nice, that's very yeah. good. Um, and and in music and in personal interactions and in uh, you know architecture, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and uh, so I feel like well that's an area maybe I can help, mm. you know. And um, but to to say this interesting question because you 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 asked it in a way that said that was based on kind of where I was going with that exercise and getting caught up in these multiple voice things. But lately, I'm fascinated with um, the same kind of information. But you know how in a like a Japanese sumi painting, they make one line and then two little lines, and all of a sudden it's a bamboo. You know, I mean, yeah, it's like, right. you know what I mean? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. This for, sort of minimalism of line that creates shape in the absence of, um, in our case, sound, mm, yeah. right? Uh, so this, instead of this... Which is very big and fluffy and full, I like this. Right, so I say... Trying to, to let the vo the voices separate a little bit mm -hmm. and swim a little more independently. Uh, So those are they're all there but they're each one of them is giving it its own its own room for you know to be beautiful in the world. It really it, yeah it's so effective. It really the emotion behind it jumps out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, very very effective. That's beautiful. It's upside down from where or again not the right term. It's a very different way of approaching the electric guitar. To bring it back to the original question, in that when you hear Angus Young, what you hear is a D chord, a G chord, and an A chord, yeah. and that's the structure of it. And then the melody is provided by the singer. Maybe a counter melody is provided by Malcolm. Mm -hmm. The bass player is doing another melody. And to be able to, I thought the orchestral example was fantastic because mm. I've, I've, I've find it borderline impossible to hear that harmony stuff. I just can't. My, my my own mind is attuned to root notes and to maybe the biggest flavor note in the chord. So yeah. the major or minor third or a, a very obvious seven or something like that. In, heart, in in an orchestra, exactly as you say, listen to the oboe player. Mm -hmm. Then listen. Follow, yeah, follow somebody. Yeah. Right. Even in a piano trio. That's a great way to unfold yeah. it. Yeah, like, it, like for instance, try this. You get a piano trio like Oscar Peterson or Bill Evans or or let's um, start with Oscar Peterson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, playing playing a, a, a you know a medium tempo thing. That's yeah, nice, yeah. Okay? yeah. And then listen to it once. Just listen to the whole thing like you might normally listen to it. Yeah. Then listen to it again and only listen to the kick drum. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's not going to be boom, boom, boom. It's going to be in that kind of music the kick drum. If you can first, you learn to hear what a kick drum sounds like mm -hmm. in that context. Yeah. And then maybe listen to it again and listen to how the kick drum, the hi hat, and the snare are living together and and interacting. Is it brushes in the snare? Then listen to it again and listen to the ride cymbal. Just the ride cymbal. Ignore everything else if you can. <laughs> then the next time, listen to the bass player. Right. Stay with the bass player all the way through. Then the next time, listen to the drummer and the bass player and how they're interacting. Yeah, yeah. By the time you've listened to it probably seven or eight times and you haven't even bothered with the, the piano chords, player yeah, or yeah. anything. Wow. And then you listen to the left hand of the piano, if you can discern it. Yeah. And then you listen to the right hand of the piano. And then you listen to it one more time or you just let it flow over you. What does that give you as a musician going through that, at that level? Well, you know how the other day you had a, a, a famous guy named Rick Beato, mm -hmm. right? And Rick could um, tell you a lot about how to mic stuff up and how to put things in a mix and how to mix and how to delay because he's an orchestrator. I mean, right. he's he, he's he may not in the particular 
venue that he was talking about, which is sort of rock music, think of himself as an orchestrator, but he really is. Mm -hmm. And so in order to orchestrate, you have to be familiar with the instruments. So Nelson Riddle, my favorite orchestrator and, and uh, composer of orchestrations, um, he knew, he was intimate with all of the instruments, what their ranges were, what their strengths and weaknesses were, mm. which ones liked to live together. Sure. I mean, if you want to hear some shit, some really brilliant shit, listen to uh, Nelson Riddle behind Frank Sinatra. Yeah, right. And that's the hippest stuff ever, harmonically. Yeah, right. And you would never think of that if you're just listening to, you know, even great guitarists or, or mm -hmm. pianists. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And, and the stuff that Quincy did with Frank yeah, as well. Exactly. The, and Billy May. Mind-blowing. Yeah. And yeah. I think that is one thing as guitar players, we do get sort of tunnel vision because I think they just look so cool. And... Well, you're, and there, there's a romantic notion, you know what I mean? You're uh, hooked into the iconography long yeah. before you are the man. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, it's but, such a thing. But also, let's check this out. I'm going to do this badly because I, I didn't cut my teeth on it like you did, but... Right, but now listen to this. And listen to this. And listen to this. Right. You put them all together and it's just this. But inside of these basic chords, there's nothing primitive or, or wrong or simplistic about those chords. They're just the chords that live down there. Yeah, right? okay. And they have all the same voice leading potential as as any other f fancy schmancy chord, you know? They so played at 116 it's, dB. <laughs> and and ACDC is a good example because their voice leading is what makes a lot of their songs sound as catchy and, and listenable as they, as they sound oh, yeah. because they're, used to, they're willing to use the occasional inversion. The bass, the bass movement in a chord progression is just as important as the melodic movement. Yep. Yep. And, it, it, you know, so it's almost tricking you into to digging good voice leading by listening to that. Amazing. It is though, because when you're playing, um, when you played what you just played, uh, uh, Georgia, the, yeah, bef Georgia on my mind. All of a sudden, you hear, I'm just hearing a whole shed load of songs from the fifties, the sixties, and seventies, uh -huh. um, and those those melodies and the way it moves starts to feel familiar because you have heard it behind yes. Frank, you have yeah, heard right. it behind all that amazing American songbook. I know that's a overused term, but mm, apt. all those songs that have been played on the radio forever, mm. and I've never understood the harmony. I, right. I listen to Frank singing and I can understand the melody for sure, or at least mm. the vocal melody. But then it's like, oh God, yeah, that's what the whole rest of everyone else is doing. Right. And if you take even that, I'll do the same thing though with a little bit. So we have this. Georgia, Georgia, I'll do it here. What the ba da da? Where'd it go? Somebody else's guitar. I'm not that bad. <laughs> right? Yeah. And and so, if you can start to hear those things, and I went in and sorted it out. I went in there and found them and listened hard. Right, that's the internal line. I call them logic lines. Yeah. Right? And they're the essential note that sort of um, the, the line of notes that live inside of this organism we call a song. And, and there could be a lot of them. Mm. I just recommend taking, if you're playing a chord progression and you really want to go into it, see what happens on a single string as the chord progression moves. Yeah. We were playing Sunny earlier. Mm -hmm. okay, let's, let's do the D string. So this note. It stays there and then it goes up there, right? 
So and then it goes when it goes from B minor seven flat five to E seven, mm -hmm. and that's the whole thing, right? Then we, let's take this one. Then let's do this. One. So you can make you can play these games where you live on where you bring out a voice, bring, and don't be afraid to go down below the G string and live down. So what's happening in this thing? Yeah. And if you do it all on one string through a chord progression, you're going to hear something essential. It, it, it loops back absolutely to what you said at the top of this chat, which was you could hear those melodies, you could hit, and you started to sing them. Yeah. 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 That's got to be essential, hasn't it? Because, again, sorry to labour the point, but when we learn those fixed positions, what did you call them, concrete Fix, positions? Fixed grips. Fixed yeah. grips, yeah. yeah. When you, you learn those fixed grips, you hear it as a whole, and you're not singing it, you're just hearing it as a chord underneath mm -hmm. a bit of singing or whatever. You're not hearing the individual parts, and it is, it's fascinating. It, yeah. It yeah, you is. have to hear, the most important thing is not the one thing or the next thing or the next thing or the next thing the most important part to hear is the journey of any individual voice through those four things yeah right that prompts a, uh, quite an interesting question because one of the one of the things i think a lot of people find very hard about learning is they'll take a chord book or a whole bunch of stuff that's written down and and they get caught up in the i don't know if it's a g flat sharp 713 or whatever it is mm. or a, or a whatever the equivalent might be and you get your brain gets so caught on that how do you feel about learning that stuff versus just listening to where the melody goes because presumably at some point it it starts to meld right um i think let's see if i can say what i mean um first of all probably the best place to start is understand your current harmonic vocabulary <laughs> anything you can play you should understand where it's going and where it's heading, where it likes to go. I always say this word, you know, D7 likes to go to G major or G minor yeah. because of what's in D has an affinity for what's in G major or G minor. And They're let's find close. out, yeah, let's find out what, okay, so what, let's find out why this wants to go to here. Like, well, that likes to go to there and this mm -hmm. likes to go to there. You know, the, the, there's these affinities, right? So if you play it, Spend some time with it, even if you don't know the names. I'm not crazy about making everybody, like, be able to spell it out. I do it because I teach it, mm. right? But a player who isn't trying to teach anybody doesn't need to have a bunch of language in their mind for this. It's sound. It's, it's, I have a shirt that says, exist in a world of sound, right? <laughs> it's one of my things, right, is that it's all about sound. We don't have, no one's listening to you talk about this shit when you're playing, Right. Uh, never went to a show and, you know, people are leaving out the hall and hear the husband talking to the wife. And she, he says, honey, that was a pretty good show. But man, he didn't explain anything. <laughs> no, nobody says that. You know? So like, first yeah. of all, take what you know. You know a lot. I've seen you play and heard you play. You know a lot of beautiful harmonic movements. Just spend a little bit of time, you know, parsing it out to find out why. Yeah. In your, for in your on your own terms, why does it work? Then why does it sound good? Maybe you give a name for it. Maybe you mm -hmm. have something that a name, a theory name, or something that you didn't understand before. Well, you now you may find out that the thing you already do has a name, yeah. and that'll help you understand what the name is all about. Um, and I don't recommend um, starting with looking in a book and trying to find some musical inspiration from it. I actually would prefer to flip it around. So particularly with chord dictionaries is, you know, you don't want to say, oh, a page of A chords. Okay, well, I like that one. That was pretty good. Well, that's a really neat one. That's too hard. And then, and then, you know, that's not the, that's not how we're going to assess that. Sure. Right. That's why I think that chord dictionaries that are randomly organized are relatively overwhelming and practically useless. Not to toot my own horn, but I think that we definitely got a new mousetrap with this mm -hmm. organizational method in, in the um, in the chord dictionary that I made. Um, so verify what you already know, right? And then the next thing is, I think, the chord progressions themselves aren't too complicated usually in music that most people like. You know? <laughs> but the melodic implication yeah. in the chord can be make a difference, mm. right? So if I say this, a 
I've got like every song in the 50s. But if I say this, same exact thing. All right, man. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you sing, took a walk around the park late last night. Okay, I can say, took a walk around the park late last night. Same melody works over this, over the, though that's just a, a, you know, it's a little, I wouldn't play that. But it's all too, there. It's all there, yeah. and it's you know, and, it, and stylistically, it might be a little off the mark, but but it, it's you know, the moment that F major is happening, in both instances, F mm. major was happening. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. So anyway, do, uh, you, do your homework, kids. Play a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to labour on this because there's a, you know, I think it's been talked about before, but when I first heard you play it reminded me one of my favorite things i've ever seen on youtube was uh, a seminar by ted green yes and i think he's just warming up before he even starts talking and then everyone's looking at him because oh are you ready but like the 10 minutes before that the stuff he's been playing which just blew my mind and when i heard you play the first time i'm like wow there's there there's ted green in there and then mm. when i first talked to you you said oh yeah um, I was a student of his. I, I literally had no idea. And you can tell by the guitar. You, I mean, just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, there's some evidence, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, how did that come about? Okay. What did what did Ted impart on you that is still very valuable today? Oh my gosh. Okay. <clears throat> I became aware of Ted. He'd written a couple of books and had a record out uh, that I worked in record stores and book in music stores. So I would you know find these things and look in a catalog and maybe have, ask my boss if I could order it or something. So I knew who he was. I uh, Modern Chord Progressions is my favorite book by Ted Green, by the way. He made four of them, um, four books. Chord Chemistry, which he jokingly referred to as Chord Catastrophe. It's uh, the kind of the quintessential chord dictionary with too, way too much information organized okay. poorly. There's a but at about halfway through the book on page 56, there's a bunch of really good educational material, but nobody got there because they look at the first page and there would be, you know, there are literally two pages of A chords, A major triads. I'm so glad you said that yeah. because I've, yeah. as much as I love Ted, yeah. I cannot get through that. Yeah, he was, I was going to start well, on page right. 56. Yeah. Well, you. Ted, you have to know Ted, in order to do the work that he did, he was rather compulsive. Okay. And so, and he was a completist. I'm also a completist, but I'm learning <laughs> not to get bogged down in it. Um, so, but he wrote this other book called Modern Chord Progressions, which similarly is a bunch of grids, page after page after page of grids, but they're these four uh, grid phrases. Right. And they're organized in some way by melody. So you'd see something like this. And the next one might be. Same chord yeah. progression and yeah, same yeah. voicings underneath, but a different melody. <laughs> that was probably about th two thirds of the way through the book. Sure. Um, I don't, not that particular example, but something like that. Yeah. Um, so he starts out relatively, you know, and then goes from there. I love that book and learned a lot from it. L love the record. Many of you have probably heard bits and pieces, if not the whole thing of this famous record um, by Ted Green called a Solo Guitar. And it's, it's incredible. If you haven't listened to it and you are uh, intrigued by this kind of thing, please do listen to it. It's on YouTube. And most of it's been written down partially accurately. He does a lot of stuff that's very hard to write down. Um, and so he he opened my ears to a world of sound that I'd never heard anybody do. I heard uh, jazz guitar, solo guitar. I'd heard Joe Pass. I'd heard um, older, you know, these kind of the banjo players that would play, you know. You know that thing, yeah, which is, yeah. a, is appealing. But, but Ted would do this lush orchestral thing. I don't think it's like even jazz, really. It, it's sort of like orchestral mm. inspired guitar. Uh, then I was working at a music store. The boss said, you want to go to the NAMM show? 
And I said, yes. And my shoe squeaked again, sorry. Um, and I walked in the NAMM show building and an elderly man walked up to me and shook my hand and said, hello, how are you doing, young man? Mel Bay. And this was, so it gives you an idea of the of the time frame. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So the first person I was like, Mel Bay, oh goody, you know. So anyway, we were wandering around. I met Herb Ellis that day. I, I played a guitar organ, uh, which don't exist anymore. It's so a guitar was rigged up for activating organ sounds pre synthesizer. Right. It was buttons or something. Um, I. I I, 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 it was fantastic. But then I walked by the Dale Zed, Zed, Zednik booth, little booth, and there was this man I recognized playing a Telecaster with his head down. And I just stood there like a, like a moron, a very happy moron. And he was he didn't stop playing. He was shy, and he didn't stop and notice the boy. You know, I was 16 at the time, you know, and, and he didn't notice that I was there. Maybe he did and kept his head down. But I, I just stood there, and I, I didn't care about anything else. I just stood there and watched him play. He was playing a Telecaster. All of his books were behind him, you know. Um, and uh, so then that's the first time I saw him in person. And pretty much that st stamped me. And I was done. I was just done, yeah. you know. Uh, I may have had a few side trips along the way, many more than a few, but that that right there was the core of it. And his love of or, or orchestra and the uh, voice leading and orchestrating on the guitar influenced me greatly to continue to pursue it as well. Um, fast forward four years later, I was maybe 19 years old, mm -hmm. uh, living near Sacramento, and I went to a jam session, and a man said, a uh, guy, he's a man now, but he was a, probably a year older than me, uh, said, hey, I hear you're, you play pretty good, man. And I played this, uh, I had made an arrangement of uh, Fly Me to the Moon with it, you know, a million yeah. chords. And I, it was bad, but it was a million chords. And he said, well, you ought to give Ted Green a call. And I said, habla, 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 you know. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I've got his number here. And so he wrote his number down and handed it to me. And I, the next day I went home and I called Ted Green. He lived in Los Angeles, northern north of Los Angeles in, in the valley, they call it. Yeah. Uh, he was living in his parents' house in Woodland Hills at the time, mm. and um, which I think he did a few times, you know, in his life uh, as things unfolded. Um, and uh, so I would, I had a girlfriend at the time whose parents lived in the same area. So we'd go down for Thanksgiving and, and uh, after I talked to Ted on the phone a couple of times, oh, by the way, I skipped that. I called him on the phone and he actually answered it. <laughs> and here's, it's perfect. I, I said, um, oh, blah, blah, blah. I must have, you know, introduced myself. And and uh, he was talking to me very, very nice. Uh, he said, hey, Tim, can, I, I want to hear what you have to say, but could you hold on for just a second? I got to flip a tape over. And then I hear him go away. I heard a little rustling, and then he comes back. He said, "Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm uh, making a, a VHS recording of a Jimmy Cagney movie because I love the music, and and I wanted to make sure I flipped it over at the right time." So then we talked a little bit more, and I said, "Well, you know, I really want to know how to play walking bass lines." Oh, okay. Well, how about this? Have you ever tried this? You send me five dollars, and I'll write out some things. I'll think. I'll look for what I've got. I'll make, and I'll send it to you in the mail. So we did that for about a year, like, yeah. wow. and he was really bad at it. He, did, I would, you know, and he was slow. He was good at it, but he was slow. He would write me a beautiful handwritten letter every time, you know. And I think I learned how to do, you know, things that like this. From those sheets, and then he would send me one chord per beat. And then you try to make that swing and all that. And there are inversions and approaches and those kinds of things. And that stuff translated pretty well because it, what was on the page, if you played it, the way. it would say it yeah. would sound a little bit. And I could I could hear him his sound in my mind, and so I could I got pretty good at sort of going for that long note, like a lot of people would play. And then then I say, okay, you got the fingerings. Now make the long make the notes longer. Right. Mm. Oops, there are no seams unless you want to see right yeah, yeah right. right right so we did that for a while then i would go down i went down once the first time i met him on the day, the day after thanksgiving we had thanksgiving at the girlfriend's parents house and uh borrowed a car and drove down to ted's parents house where he was staying and we had a long afternoon lesson that i taped then some was hiding somewhere in my boxes of stuff um and then I would do that, 
we did that maybe three or four times. Finally, we I moved down there to go to GIT, right. and and lived in yeah. Hollywood, and would borrow a car. You can't ha- you can't not have a car in, in yeah, yeah, LA, yeah. and the buses wouldn't get from point A to point B very effectively. So I'd borrow somebody's car and drive up in, in the evening to apartment number nine, and usually I'd arrive way too early and because I was afraid of being too late. And uh, but then he we'd start at nine o'clock, and sometimes I wouldn't leave until eleven thirty, oh, you know. Crazy. And he was kind to me, kinder probably than any adult male had ever been to me. I, that took me, um, I, you know, sort of warmed my heart. He was strong with me though, because I was full of piss and vinegar, and mm. I was a little more than a little arrogant because I could play a little bit, you know. And so he settled me down and and uh, uh, helped me. It was a very very wonderful thing. And then I end up with you know a stack of paper because he would give me like literally a year's worth the work every time I went there. And I didn't go every week like some guys did because yeah, yeah. I felt like that would be excessive. I just, he'd give me something, I'd work on it and come back when, and put, you know, call him and book another lesson when I had something to show for. It. And I did that for, you know, four or five years and then I got a road gig and I, and I uh, left town and then I didn't see him after that. And right. I think the last time I saw him, I went to his place was in 86 or, no, no, before that, sorry. Yeah, 86, mm. um, and uh, and lost lost contact with him because he, he, he didn't really answer his phone. I was sure. uh, surprised that he answered his phone when I called him the first time because it was really unusual, you know. Right. But anyway, that's the Ted Green that's... thing. I have pages and pages. Then they released all that stuff after he died. It's it's in mm-hmm. you know the the tedgreen.com. I'm fortunate to be you know associated with that group of people a little bit, and I made some. Um, uh, but I was asked to make um, sort of explanation videos for some of his arrangements because you get an arrangement and it's like, ah, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I thought it would be helpful if somebody could actually hear it. Yeah. And so right. I took a, there's probably about 20 or 23 or four of them. Um, I have them on a playlist playlist on YouTube. And, you know, I don't, there's, I don't put ads on them and I did them for free and it's yeah. just a, my duty. Yeah. You know, fulfill my. It's a beautiful thing to do, man. It really is. It's, um, yeah. So. That was too long of a story for. No, no, you know, no. Honestly, it's amazing. We I mean, both this, sat here going, "Oh my the god!" Thing is, the, I, I think anyone with um, a personal connection to Ted. Uh, I mean, a, it's very it's rare that you know you get to sit down and have a conversation, but also anyone that is affected by the way Ted would play. It's a it's wonderful to hear about. Yeah, so thank you yeah. very much for that. That's great. I, and I did want to um, I wanted to ask sort of you know coming to to where we are now yes. about because I discovered you through YouTube. Mm-hmm. So how has that changed things for you? Because you've been very busy as a teacher. You've been a, you know full time professional musician. Now you post a few things on YouTube, and everyone's. Sort of external from your world is now also discovering you and what you do. Mm-hmm. How has that impacted you? Well, I have a kind of a there was a little kink in here is I took a break, right? And I lived off the grid for 13 years. Wow, didn't own a guitar and didn't play. Wow, um, I heard that Ted died, some other things happened. Uh, were leading up to, and so I decided to come back to the world. And um, that was in 2006. Right. I very quickly sort of got my fingers to comply, re- renewed some old uh, acquaintances, and, and started playing. Um, and I made my first YouTube video, I think, in 2000 and. Eight maybe mm. so relatively early yeah not not the primal years but As relatively it was kind early of, kind yeah. of ramping up and I had yeah. at that time I had and people were making videos with flip phones and it was mm. all compressed and nicky sounding and I had a I had a, a pretty good primitive way primitive by today's standards mm. but even by what I use which is way primitive compared to what you have <laughs> but um, uh, anyway it looked good and it sounded good compared to what else was out mm. there. And I think I was playing in a way that that um, I played a. I, my first one was, "Why do piano players get all the fun? Have all the fun?" And it was uh, something. It was an improvised performance, something like I played at the beginning of that. You know, 
it's just some stuff I was working on at the time, and I always like piano you playing. You can hear the left hand and the right yeah, hand. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I put that out, and people like commented on it and said, "Ooh, this, ooh, that." And I thought, "Oh, that might be neat." And then I made a couple of gear related. I made a very uh, well watched video yep. about this pickup. Yeah. Um, and as bad as the sound quality was, I think it still hold, maybe holds some water today. And then I just started. I'm, I like like to think of myself as an accidental YouTuber. Right. I just did it because I wanted to share. I have this sharing thing. Yeah. And I wanted to share, and I felt like, oh, here's a way to get, you know, people who like the silly thing that I do, you know, get them to hear it and share it. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have an overarching, you know, kind of take over the world in three, you know, three years or, you know, get to this a number of views or this yeah. number of likes yeah. and blah, blah, blah. I was just doing it because I like doing it. Yeah. And then suddenly people started... Um, wanted to take lessons and I figured out that this new thing called Skype would allow me to give lessons to people who lived in Singapore or wherever and so I started using Skype also a very early yeah, yeah. adopter and it would oh so funny though I mean sometimes I'd have to turn the thing on and off five or six times during a one hour lesson because the signal would go bad or whatever I would say oh, I think we need to get into a better tube let me call you right back <laughs> you know and um all sorts of fun stuff like that. Uh, and along with, you know, a fairly rigorous um, uh, personal one-on-one -on -one teaching schedule yeah. and gigging. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I was talking to my wife the other day. Maybe Luke was there. And he, she said, well, you've been together for 17 years. Yeah, but for the first six years, I didn't even see him because he was out all the time working. Because yeah, you know? yeah. I needed to make up for lost time. I had yeah, sure. no... I had to make, you know, I didn't have a retirement. I didn't have any money. I needed to, you know, work. And I was yeah. okay with that. You know, I could sit and teach for eight hours. I was, you know, a little more interesting than sitting and staring at the floor for eight hours, which I was <laughs> what I was doing before. So, uh, so anyway, uh, it, so YouTube sort of embraced me. Right. And then at some point, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to uh, put ads on, but I realized if I didn't, YouTube would. Yeah. And yeah. so I okay. began monetizing about five or six years mm. after that. Um, and then uh, started understanding a little bit. People, kind-hearted people, good good people who cared about me would say, you know, if you do this, it might be better. Or if you do that, it might get more views or whatever. And then YouTube keeps changing. Sure. It yeah, seems yeah, like yeah, the yeah. algorithm uh, emphasizes day. different things every time. So it's it's a moving target. And if it went away... You know, if I became obsolete or inconsequential to what YouTube wants to be, perhaps there might be another venue uh, that, you know, because I did MySpace for about 10 minutes and that yeah, was yeah. neat, you know. And you, of course, it's on True Fire. And, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, I don't, yeah. you know, YouTube is really wonderful, though, because I believe in community. I believe in in um, like-minded people getting support from each other. Yeah. And this business of, like you said, we're sitting here and it's just so, you know. It's amazing. It's, 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 it's beautiful, right? Yeah. So I like that. I think it's important to do that. Yeah. And, um, some kind of acting together and being together. So live music is part of that. Teaching is part of that. Making things that are maybe once or twice removed via video and all that. Um, I heard something on the radio once that really helps me with YouTube. And you guys, this you guys do this too, um, but I st sort of studied on it real hard. This was well before YouTube. I heard someone on the radio say, "When you're talking on the radio, it's a mistake to think that you're talking to hundreds or thousands of people, because you're only talking to one person. Because when someone listens to the radio, they, yeah. they're by themselves listening to the radio. Yeah, so when I'm on YouTube, I'm 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 imagining." that I'm talking to one person who's looking at their screen and maybe has a guitar in their lap or maybe they're looking at their phone at a bus stop or whatever it is, right? And so I kind of try and remember that. I don't mm. say, I might say at the beginning, oh, hey, guys. But yeah. then from then on, it seems best and it seems most natural for me to to talk about, um, talk to somebody, show. you know, or show or play for somebody, mm. you know. And I think that's maybe part of my brand, if you want to call it that. You know, kind of folksy demeanor, soft voice, and and um, you know, self-effacing humor, and all those kinds of things, which might be in somewhat short supply. An actual human being. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we yeah. try. We try Beautiful. our best. Imagine the, we try our best to at least create the illusion. <laughs> but so I think that that means that I don't have fifty million that clicked once on that thing because they were they saw the headline that says yeah, yeah, yeah. you know this is the only scale you need to learn how to play bebop 
Um, everybody knows you need three. <laughs> um, but but I feel like I'm, you know, 50,000 subscribers who would actually maybe support me in yeah, some way. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're yeah. engaged. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, we have yeah. that conversation yeah. all yeah. the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's far, far better to have a smaller audience that's engaged with you yeah. and that, that right. you all share something right. rather yeah. than have this huge disparate yeah. right. like, who don't. Yeah. Simon Neal said on the show he'd rather have 100 fans and, and that they were his favorite band, yeah. Than a million fans who they kind of liked, yeah. You know? yeah. And that's yeah. I think that goes for playing live too, for yeah, playing shows. Sure. I, yeah, yeah. I get, I, we play large, you know, halls and large venues, and I, I, I get disconcerted because I can't see past the first row and I yeah. don't know, you know what I mean. So I mean, you can get used to that, of course. But I really love it when there's. I mean, I'd love it just playing right here for you. This, yeah, this, yeah. This group would be wonderful, you know. <laughs> um, we could talk uh, for a week about all of this stuff and more please check tim out there'll be loads and loads of links in the uh description below we should finish up talking a little bit about tone okay indeed okay. just hearing you here with a telecaster into deluxe reverb and a princeton obviously it's that pedal show so there has to be two amps um <laughs> it's just the most beautiful i mean for a start in order to pull out all that harmony melody intonate your intonation is just Oh, thank you. I'm, I fight. I, my, I fight with it. it, it really? I, well, my ears are very, very sensitive. Yeah. Mm. And sometimes I just feel like I can't quite get it in tune. So then, then the neck wiggling helps, and yeah. bending a note up a little bit or whatever. That's but, for you, guy who always says, "Why the hell do you uh, bend the neck all the time? It's really stupid." Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's not really stupid. <laughs> the guitar's never in tune. So what we do is we do. I do the like. Check it out. That's a lovely modulation effect. Yeah, yeah. If I do this, put some angels in there, <laughs> and and so it's not hurry early or this. It's just a little gentle. Push. Yeah. And in fact, if I'm doing too much over here, I don't wiggle it. I just play this. Sometimes people see this when they see Ted. What does he have, a palsy or something? No, he's milking it over here with his forearm. That is gold. And then down here, you gotta be careful because it'll go, you know. You, you, but you might want it. that sometime. Maybe do you do. And I also pin the guitar here. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's that part of it. If you heard a crackle there, one of the amps isn't very happy. Oh, it's not sorry. Um, <laughs> I think it's the Princeton because it got a really good hammer in the other day. Um, so it's but tone, yeah. It's it's guitar amp, yeah. a bit of reverb, right? And Charlie this, Christian this neck pickup. Charlie Christian by Lawler. Okay, here here's the recipe. I'll give you as best as I can. Yeah. Um, that, of course, now you're in, hearing the hum, which goes away at about seven yeah but and i've been keeping it about there because we're talking but i'll get it up where it where it really wants to be um full up is a little bit strident for me so i take it back and that's my favorite tone control the volume yeah, right. the volume yeah. knob is my favorite tone control. volume knob is up all the way by the way and the amp uh there's the trebles are set around around two or three Maybe less. I'm not afraid to put the treble on zero. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, and I, mean, I prefer to have the amp, which is more gifted at sculpting bass and treble and mids than this knob is. Sure. All right. Okay. So uh, the pick just went. So that's okay. Um, so volume knob a little bit. So there's a little bit left. Oh no, that's okay. I don't need that. Um, more if you need. Now, of course, on a blues gig, it's a different recipe but for this thing mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah. then i'll turn it down a little bit more so i can talk and play mm -hmm. because that's a, it's too hard to stop and do either one so what i do is i don't have i have very very short nails on my right hand mm -hmm. the little finger has a little bit more because this finger is shorter and i use that for the melody i use because it's about an inch closer to the bridge and it has a little nail on it so then I say, you know. Uh, 
um, the these three fingers, the only thing the nail is there for is so that it slides off the string. I'm not using the nail to pluck. Yep. I'm using the nail like a backstop so that the oh, wow. so that the string doesn't go too far into the flesh and cause you know snaggedy problems. the 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 fingernails need to be polished with an emery board so that they're smooth. We don't want grit. We don't want. Yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. So that's part. The nail isn't. Here's the nail producing a note. Here's the finger with the nail as a backstop producing that same note. So then I thought Wes Montgomery had my favorite tone, especially like on tequila. Mm -hmm. That was another Ted Green influence. He really loved Wes and he wanted me to hear these beautiful tones. Well, Wes used the, you know, the, the left side of his right thumb and maybe some people contend, and I think it's true, that he mostly played with the whole thumb. Yeah. In fact, even picked up strokes with it as well. If you've never seen any video of Wes Montgomery yeah, watching, playing, please watch it. It's, he plays it's in, his yeah. hand out like this on a big L5, and then instead of doing this sort of style with, for instance, octaves, the familiar sound. Yeah. Most people play it like that. He played it like this. So you had a big, big, fat, fleshy mm -hmm. thing going on. Well, I discovered that the fattest part of my first finger wasn't, wasn't this part of it. It was this part of it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and you can see on my hand, it sort of resembles a little tiny, there's a little blurb there. Right, yeah. And that's from having my... Right? So just single notes, I pull the string down and in, and then release it. Sorry. I discovered that, right? You know what that reminds me of? Not the same thing at all, but Alan Hines only upstrokes. Oh yeah, I know yeah, Alan, you know, and I noticed that about him when yeah, he was, yeah. when we were both little boys <laughs> you, at, at GIT. He only upstrokes, yeah, and he has a very unique sound. So every yeah. note gets that same business. Yeah. I I got into an Albert Collins phase, and I and I um, thought, oh that I don't play like him, but it, it's just a big fat sound, right? Mm. So then I thought, well, when I play this. All, I want that on everybody, right? So the thumb is, although I have a nail on my thumb, that's for plucking the harmonics, right? So I need something when I tip my thumb straight in to pluck the harmonics. I need the thumb to be pointing down, so I grow a little nail. It's a little long right now. It's longer than usual. So the little nail here and little nail here, mostly no nails there, and don't touch the string with the nail. But I, I with all of my fingers, I pull in, and I'll sacrifice speed and and, and whatnot for tone for tone yeah, all yeah, day long yeah, yeah. All right um, I don't like scratchy I don't like thin I like it fat and lush and I fear I realize this is the source of That's that. Crazy. Heavy strings, uh, these are a little light for me. Um, although lately my hands are kind of falling apart a little bit, so I would go from 12 to 54 unwound G to 11 to 50 um, balance tension, these yep. Diodario balance yep. tension. Yep. These are just, a, these are okay. And also for me, a straight neck and low action. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's a compromise, but for me to do the business over here, yeah, I can't okay. I can't have a lot of, you know, muting and uh, you know, yeah. like on this guitar is good, but the other one that I played earlier, maybe the action for me was a little high because sure. of, you know. So I like it to be glassy. That's another mm -hmm. thing I got from Ted is a real straight neck, heavier strings, sometimes quite heavy, mm -hmm. and maybe tuned down. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that too separately. Um, and then and then a light touch, but a firm touch. Right. Have to be able on this thin string up here. So you say. No, we want that. So we want that note 
to sound as good as that now. Yeah, yeah. It's a different set of harmonics. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it really yeah. is. It really is. I, I, I've got to say, Tim, that is my favourite ever explanation. When someone tells me about their tone, we say, go on and tell us about your tone. They spend 25 minutes talking about their pedal, so you spend 10 minutes talking about your right <laughs> hand. <laughs> Hey, this the you know what it is. There's the lesson. Yeah, it's yeah. it's the first gain stage. Yeah, it really is. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. I love that. It's brilliant. And then the other part of the sound. It's I don't know if it's tone or not because that really the tone production I believe is you draw the note out of the guitar. You don't mm. whack at it from a distance. You draw it out. And yeah. That, and okay. For me, this this physical effect. It's milking. I'm milking this thing to get a sound, right? And I have to be careful. Sometimes you want to reach for something, and if you don't attack it nicely, it sounds thin and scratchy, you know? So, so you work. But then this hand over here holds things down. So there's a, an articulation of the right hand again. How loud do you pluck the string so that it rings and it sings over the top of whatever else is ringing. So I love this effect of that stays. It's still going. Yeah. <laughs> they like it too. Yeah. Um, so that's another another part. Another part for me is the what I do with my left hand to get the the swimming effect yes. of the notes, um, the, the, the length, the note length. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so for me, you know, uh, ES-175 with flat one strings, high action, because that's what they said in the magazines you need, and a polytone amp, everything, every note's going to be short. And if it starts getting too long, it's because of feedback, right? So it's just a, not a, it's, it's like, and every note then has a sameness. Oh, there's, yeah, there's a, yeah. It's a lacking, a, not that everybody does this. Of course, there's brilliant um, examples to the contrary of this. But typically, you know, the big guitar with flat on strings, high action, and a dead sounding amplifier um, means that there's going to be a lot of short notes. Mm -hmm. Even to the extent that there's this thing, I'll take that pick now. There's this thing style of playing where you say and, and it's because this, the guitar is so dead they need to hit that melody note three times in order to get it to ring because it won't ring yeah and it always seems like it's three times da -da 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 -da. could you just play it with your without the pick just the same thing just for the contrast okay. what I don't remember what I got about I wish you could be in the room. I wish you could be in the room to exp like feel that. It's amazing. It's uh, what I love is you recognizing that for you to be able to connect the way that you want to connect and say what you want to say, you've understood the importance. Like down to that level, my nail needs to be this long. To get that right, it's it's. I love that. It's really beautiful. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> really, really great. Really great. Thank you for noticing that. I noticed that. No, it's, yeah. <laughs> and well, yeah. I, well, this whole business about length of note and whatnot. I think the melody should sing. I would never yeah. want to hear a singer that said, um, "Just friends, lovers, no more." <laughs> Still friends. It's emo jazz. You know, but when we play, we play like that. Yeah. And we, it's like, we play like a singer that we don't want to hear. So I say... We play like a singer we don't want to hear. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> and I might say something like this. So I want to play... So the melody, just friends, lovers no more, still friends, but not like before. 
know, and so I want it to sound like the guitar player knows the song. Yeah, you know? right. You no, know, really knows the song. Listen, know how a singer would sing it. And that doesn't mean that you hit the note over and over and over to get it to ring. You hit right. it and let it ring. Yeah. yeah. I've just had a vision of Dan in the corner of a pub somewhere. That's my future. That is That's absolutely future. my future. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not getting paid it's, it's either. Just alone in, <laughs> facing the corner no, with a guitar going. That hat's going to be on the floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, that's another way to get the neighborhoods. Maybe right. we'll talk about this in the in the vlog, but but um, to sing. So and my little my little singy voice, you know, it's like. Make sure you can sing all this melody yeah. stuff. Yeah, right. And just, I, ho I hope the camera is picking up the economy of what just happened there. It's so much harmonic and melodic knowledge in a small space <laughs> without having to dive all over the place and beat yourself up with six finger stretches, six yeah, fret yeah, stretches. And yeah. Those are okay too, but they're, but most of the notes are right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Like whenever I hear Oscar Peterson, you can always hear him go, yeah, 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 yeah. you know. Yeah, and even yeah. though what he's singing is completely atonal, he's hearing it in his head. That's sort yeah, of yeah. coming out. Right. I yeah. noticed that as you were warming up, that yeah. you're singing as you go. I grumble. Yeah. I, I made a. Um, I was lucky enough to make a video with Jim Mullen once, mm -hmm. and uh, because of the nature of the way the guitar was mic'd, I couldn't get rid of it. So uh, yeah, yeah. Pretty much I've over had, the whole video, I'm yeah. hearing him going. Well, mm -hmm. I have had to learn. So here's here's the evolution of that. You know. Um, uh, right to this. I go. I'm playing silent trumpet because I I want I want the no, I want I want the nose to be embodied and and the breath. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, is is all part of that. Like a saxophone player, they're blown into that thing. You know, yeah, and that's why yeah. we try. That's why we are compelled to do it. I did it unconsciously. Uh, you know, for a while. You know, singing. You know, if I was anywhere near a mic, you'd hear it. Um, and then I realized this. I got a. I was starting to record with Pearl Django uh, about seven years ago, and I was playing uh, arch up guitar with a, an amplifier, but also a mic on the guitar, and I ruined a couple of good, really good takes. Oh, okay. Good solos were ruined by my moaning and groaning. Uh, I still do it a little bit live, but um, I, I had to learn how to do something besides vocalizing audibly. Right. Okay, right. so actually a thing then, yeah, yeah. I do it on purpose, and I tried to learn how to do it because I wanted to, again, embody every note Ooh, wow. with something that was, you know, happening. And then, and you know, you can't play run on phrases if you can't, you know, you got to stop to breathe. There's a really important point in there about what you're hearing and experiencing as the player, because I think so, most of us are completely focused on sticking these on the guitar and a note comes out, and that's your entire focus, but you're beyond that. You're thinking about the ensemble, you're thinking about the whole experience, and I think as a result, and this might be a bit of a stretch, it almost frees what you're doing on the guitar because you're thinking about something else other than only playing the guitar. Is that... Or you're not thinking about anything. Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. And here's what I'm thinking about. You know. That's so good. That's yeah. mad. That is mad. And 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 then you know, to to slim it down, like I was talking about before, it doesn't have to be you know, you know all that business. Mm. It can just be this. You know, I don't have to worry about keeping time or stressing out about it. The chords are there when they want to be there. The melody's flowing, and and we're, that's it's it's kind of this conversational, you know. It gives it that. It gives it spaces. Yeah, yeah. Because you might assume if you're not into listening or playing to that kind of that style of music that it is overly complex and always rushed. And I'm just getting the absolute opposite of yeah. that. Hmm. It's so the complete musical. Opposite yeah, of yeah, that. yeah. It's really beautiful. Flipping hook. 
We are, uh, we could do this for okay, hours and hours, and then we will. You, you, so, yeah. <laughs> part <a> two. <laughs> um, yeah, we didn't even touch on. Oh, we we'll uh, do that you know, next time. We'll do we'll that. Do, yeah, time. yeah. That was more but, and more uh, smoke and mirrors. Anyway, I, I want to say thank you um, on behalf of everyone that's ever watched you your videos because you know that's the way I got, was turned on to you. I want to say thank you for coming today and just sharing. All the stuff with us has been really wonderful. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you to Luke and Ian for making it happen. Yeah, I think yeah, we they say did. A little thank they you did. for this guitar as well. Should we? Yeah, John Green, yeah, a local boy who lives nearby, uh, contacted me when he found out I was coming, and he I, he said I I've got a guitar for you if you need it, and I was thinking about not bringing a guitar for obvious reasons. I'm very I'm very devoted to my mm -hmm. couple of my guitars. Number one and number two are just like they just they I live in them, you know. Yeah. And I said, well, what have you got? And he said, well, I got a guitar that's just like yours. And I said, okay, <laughs> that'll do it. Yeah. And it turns out that he it, he got, it's really close. So um, no caster from the custom shop and it has the right pickup in it. And so thank you very much, John Green. Beautiful. Yeah, there we go. Well, we'll get um, Tim to play us out, but you know, thank you, mate. It's just oh, so awesome. You're welcome. Um, thanks for watching. Subscribe to all that stuff, all the information in the description below uh, if you want to find out more about Tim and what he does, and uh, it's all there. Massive thank you to anyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com and grab some merch, um, all the t-shirts and hats and shenanigans. A, a jazz guitar playing a hat for tips. And, <laughs> yeah. Very good. <laughs> yes. Um, hey, you and, want a tip, kid? <laughs> <laughs> take up the trombone. <laughs> Uh, thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your support. And also our preferred retailers. All the stuff in the description. Details below. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we're going to get Tim to play us out. But uh, uh, Step on a monk. <laughs> <laughs>